From bureaus worldwide, this is FSM. Thanks very much, Ollie. Wet, windy, miserable Salford in Greater Manchester today. Ain't it always so? Welcome to the Richie Allen Show. Great to be with you. I mean that there's no place I'd rather be than here with thee. It's Twitter at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's where you'll find me if you'd like to send me a message between now and the end of the programme. Let's get on with it. The Richie Allen Show. Right, where are we? Yeah, that's right. And the truth shall set you free. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Very important story covering tonight. The solicitor and campaigner Fanola Moss will join the programme live from Sheffield, where she'll be discussing the national scandal, although it is little known about how autistic and learning disabled people are forcibly taken into care when they turn 18. But they are turned over to some of the biggest corporations in the world, healthcare companies, including American ones. They are cash cows for massive corporations. And very few people know about this. And Fanola Moss has been raising hell about this because of her own personal experience of it for a number of years trying to get the attention of the UK media. Huge story. We'll talk about that with Fanola Moss a little bit later on this hour. Before that, though, we'll round up the news. We'll look at some of the biggest stories uh, making the headlines today, not just here, but across the pond as well. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Hang on there. Got to take a little sip of water. A little, little sip of Ishka there. It's funny that, isn't it? <clears throat> I'm still at the tail end of an old infection from a couple of weeks back, so just at the tail end of it, still get a little bit hoarse every now and then. A little horse, that's the one, a little horse. So you know how to contact the programme, I'm sure you'll be affected by what uh, Fanola is on to talk about. I know there will be people listening who are caught up on it because I've already been given the heads up today, so look out for that uh, real soon. Hillary Clinton is being accused today of interfering with UK politics. Why? Well, because in an interview with the BBC, Clinton criticised the UK government for delaying a report into Russian interference in UK elections. She's been all over the BBC, has Clinton and her daughter, Chelsea Clinton, because they've got a book out, C. They've got a book out, C, and it's a book about gutsy women. Yeah, and they're hawking it. Now, they were on various BBC TV and radio shows. They dropped in to visit the BBC Radio 5 mid-morning show, which is currently hosted by a woman called Emma Barnett, or Emma Barnett. I've had lots to say about that woman in the past, so I won't repeat myself. I'll move on. Anyway, on the Emma Barnett show, here is Hillary Clinton on the Russian meddling report and why it should be published now. I want to say one thing about the election, however, um, and not personalize it. I find it inexplicable that your government will not release a government report about Russian influence. Inexplicable and shameful. You're having an election. People deserve to know what is in that report. You know, we had a somewhat similar problem in 2016. Trump and his campaign were under investigation for their connections with Russia uh, and Russians and Russian cutouts and Russian agents and others promoting Russian interests. And the public didn't know before the election. And I would hate to see that happen here, whatever the outcome. You know, I don't I don't know what's in it any more than anybody else does. But certainly, people who are about to vote in a, in a month or so deserve to know what is in a report that one has to speculate must have something of concern. Otherwise, why wouldn't it be publicly disclosed? But by even drawing that comparison, are you of the school of thought that there is some similarities when people say Boris Johnson is the British Trump? I'm saying that Russia... <laughs> oh, Jesus. 
I'm saying that Russia played in your Brexit election just like Russia played in our 2016 election. Proof, proof, Hillary. You just said a second ago you haven't seen the report and you don't know what's in it. So where's the proof that the Russians interfered in UK elections? And while you're there, Hillary, what about the proof that the Russian government or Russian intelligence agencies tried to interfere in the US election? Any proof, Hillary? Any chance that Emma Barnett would ask her for proof? Who did what, what they knew, where the money went, where it came from, what it influenced, that is something that should be investigated and revealed. Oh, it should be investigated. I thought you knew, Hillary. I thought you knew. You were pretty explicit, so you were, that you knew. And where it came from, what it influenced, that is something that should be investigated and revealed to the uh, British public, just like it should have been before our election. I mean, a push, a push by as a minister has said it, it hasn't been published at this point because of government rules during yeah. an election. But but there's the point that you're making. That's so right. That's the that's pushback right. from the government side. Yeah, Barnett is worthless. I won't get into it because I've had a lot to say about her and her family in the past. So many things you could ask Hillary Clinton. You know, n- nothing speculative but hard facts about the behaviour of Clinton and her family. But the BBC allows her to basically walk right across the floors of the corporation, drop in on shows here and there, and hawk her book like some sort of really important, you know, liberal that really needs to be heard. You had Barnett tweeting out a photograph of herself and the Clintons, Hillary and her daughter, Barnett looking like a puppy dog. That's where journalism is in the 21st century. That's a bit of a buzz or a catchphrase of mine, but it is. That's where we are. You know, you know, starstruck journalists throwing softball questions at a mass murdering war criminal paedophile apologist that we've come to know as Hillary Clinton. But then that is the BBC, is it not? Let's leave that one there for now. Fun and games in Blackpool this afternoon. Jeremy Corbyn was there. And as he was out and about, Jeremy, he came across a pack of photographers and they were a bit boisterous. A bit boisterous, a bit rowdy. They do, they jostle for position and they can be a bit aggressive and they can crowd people. And Jeremy Corbyn quipped, under socialism, you will all cooperate. And the Daily Mail, among other newspapers, has called this sinister. Irony is fucking dead, is it? Is it? He was joking. He was joking, you snowflakes. He's not a socialist anyway. They're calling him dear leader and stuff because he said to the photographers, jesting with them, under socialism you will all cooperate. Have we really got that bad now? Irony is dead. Farage, Nigel Farage was all over telly. He was all over telly today. Talk radio and his pal Julia Hartley Brewer. Julia said to him, hey Nigel, were you offered a peerage? by the Conservative Party before telling the Conservative Party that you would stand down your candidates in Tory-held constituencies. Did you get that peerage offer, Nigel, before you made your own offer? What did Nigel say? I don't work for the Conservative Party. And as I've said, left to their own devices, they will drop all the, all the promises and pledges that they've made. Also, in terms of numbers... I mean, some of these arguments being made today are ludicrous because, of course, in the Labour heartlands, the Brexit Party takes more votes from the Labour Party than it takes from the Conservatives. And we saw that back in 2015 when actually the effect of UKIP hurt Labour a lot more in terms of seats than it did the Conservatives. Um, And in terms of what you've been offered in return for this, a lot of people are saying you've been offered a peerage. Have you? The first time I was offered something was a safe Conservative seat in 2005. Uh, Since then, there have been about 12 attempts, I think, uh, to get me to accept jobs, titles, ranks, all as a means of buying me off. Uh, I'm sorry to say to them, I'm not for sale. But you have been offered a peerage this time round? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. But uh, I, 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 Judith, I'm not interested. Would you know, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying you'd be you'd be bored of Ripage, But if the if at the end of all this Brexit's delivered and there's no need for the Brexit party anymore, of course, as you say, that may be some time hence uh, once we've got all that done. If if it happens, would you want to have a pitch? Would you want to sit in I the house? I don't want anything. He doesn't want anything. There you are. He doesn't want a thing. He just wants Brexit for Christmas. But he won't get Brexit for Christmas because Santa can't fit it down the bloody chimney. Speaking of Christmas, Extinction Rebellion has got a song out. This is not a joke. When I saw this earlier, I did have to do a double, treble and even a quadruple take. (laughs) Extinction Rebellion are aiming to secure the Christmas number one after releasing a new track to tackle climate change. I wonder how much carbon they expended in making this song. Will they tell us? I don't know. Probably quite a bit. A lot of hot air. Plenty of CO2 and hot air. Anyway, the protest group, they've joined forces with the Jade Assembly. I never heard of them, but then again, I've not heard of anything since 1996. But the Jade Assembly have worked with Extinction Rebellion on a new track for Christmas, which is called Time for Change. And Time for Change calls for change. Environmental action to save the planet. Wow, they have a song out. Do you hear that, Brian Cox? Brian Cox, Extinction Rebellion, has released a Christmas song. Fuck off. No, they have, honest to God. Tom Cruise, do you hear that? Extinction Rebellion is a song out. No, could you repeat it? Because I, I can't believe my fucking ears. Yeah, Extinction Rebellion is a song out. And the track has lyrics like, Act now before we're all dead. <laughs> and it's got a music video, which features footage from their global protests over the last six months interspersed with altered footage altered footage which shows the House of Parliament on fire that's fucking hate speech they've doctored the Houses of Parliament and made it look like they're on fire that's an incitement to violence if ever I saw one do you want to hear the pile of shite you do here's them about 30 seconds of it bang goes copyright for this show I need you now I need you now I need you now Really catchy, huh? But it's time for a change. So come on! Come on! So come on! Come on! Come on and save the planet with me! Somebody tell Greta that it is the worst Christmas song of all time. Worse even than Mr. Blobby. How dare you? What was that? How dare you? Fuck off, it's rubbish. Right, let's move on. 16 minutes it is past the hour. It is a lunatic asylum, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Now, according to the Evening Standard this afternoon, the family of former British Army officer and White Helmet's co-founder, James Lemezier. The family today said they were in the dark about the circumstances of his death in Istanbul. I don't know how long it takes for a coroner to do an investigation, probably a day. I don't know how long or how much that costs. It probably costs a couple of thousand pounds. So we can save the money and save the coroner and tell the family he was thrown out of a second floor window, lads. That's what happened to him. He was thrown out of a second floor window. Plenty of enemies. It was either some of the people he worked with because they were worried about him spilling the beans on what the White hel- Helmets even really are, or it was agents of the Syrian government. Now, I don't believe in violence. I don't endorse it. I do not condone it. But if the Syrian government, knowing what James Lemezier was doing, because he was funneling arms to so-called moderate rebels in Syria. And these moderate rebels, of course, are terrorists. So the Syrian government are well within their rights, you know, to go after this guy, even though I don't condone violence. Somebody murdered him. It's pretty obvious to me. They're trying to blame it on the Russians. The Ruskies did it, of course. The Russians... Now, listen, I don't defend Russia. I'm not Vanessa Bealey or the Ponytail Ponce. I'm not in the pay of anybody. Nobody. Okay, I criticise regularly the Russian government and Putin, who's a criminal, an arch-criminal. 
I used to report years ago on the Sochi Winter Olympics and all of that. It's it's just as corrupt Russia is as the UK and America. Just as corrupt. And it equally acts in its own interests. But it's not more corrupt than we are. And when it hasn't done something, like it didn't poison the script as in Salisbury, I know this like I know that I'm broadcasting to you today. I know this, right? Um, you've got to be honest about it. And I know that James Le Messier and the White Helmets were a fake front um, civil defence group that was really set up to funnel, as I said, money and arms and training to lunatic head choppers. That is my opinion. And I'm sticking with it. Quite a bit of it I can prove. Some of it is up in the air. I don't know how he died. Maybe he did throw himself out of a second floor window, maybe. Maybe he's a Man City fan. Maybe he's a Man City fan. He watched the game on Sunday, listened to Roy Keane and Graham Soonis and went, fuck that, straight out the window. It happens! Now, here's a serious story. Well, that was serious too, but this is serious. Lawyers, medical professionals and technical experts have reacted with horror when they learned that Google has been secretly acquiring sensitive medical data on millions of people without their knowledge or their consent. Questions were immediately raised around the ethics of the data gathering. And this is codenamed Project Nightingale, by the way. Huge questions about this. This was reported last night in the good old US of A. Other people calling for an immediate change to privacy laws. Because Google and a healthcare company called Ascension boasted of sharing this data and boasted that the scheme is completely legal. This is not good. Here's CBS News this morning and their This Morning program. A new report suggests Google has been secretly collecting the personal health records of millions of Americans. According to the Wall Street Journal, the effort is codenamed Project Nightingale. It reportedly involves a deal made last year with Ascension, a leading nonprofit health system which includes more than 2,600 facilities in 21 states. Patients and doctors were not notified. Our doctor, Tara Narula, is here. Tara, good morning. Uh, what are the concerns here? Are there violations? Is it legal? Good morning, Tony. So Ascension says the work it's doing with Google is compliant with HIPAA, the federal patient privacy law. The companies say the goal of this data collection is to provide better care to patients. Since it's just getting reported now, the program is creating major privacy concerns. The multi-billion dollar healthcare industry has long been on the radar for tech behemoth Google. And now it's in it in a big way. As first reported in the Wall Street Journal, Ascension is sharing information with Google, a health system that includes over 2,600 hospitals and healthcare centers in 21 states. In the program called Project Nightingale, Ascension is reportedly providing patient names and dates of birth, as well as lab results, hospitalizations, and diagnoses to Google. Google is using the information, in part, to help Ascension centralize its patient database, as well as design new software that will use artificial intelligence to predict or identify medical conditions. There are huge advantages to digital health information. We Pam Dixon is with the World Privacy Forum and says digital records are necessary. So is knowing exactly what companies are doing with such personal and private information and how they are protecting it. Leaks of private medical information are enormously common. The Department of Health and Human Services actually tracks all of, of the medical data breaches and actually some of the largest data breaches in history have been medical data breaches. So it is a significant concern. In a press release, Google and Ascension say they are fully committed to a robust data security and protection effort and fully compliant with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Act of 1996 that protects patient privacy. CBS Tara, Dr. Tara Anula, there you heard. But Dr. Robert Epstein, who's a well-known author in America and he's a medical researcher, he's also been an editor-in-chief at Psychology Today. He tweeted, you can't make this shit up. Be afraid. Hashtag be afraid. The data that was basically shared without the consent of people included names, addresses, dates of birth, lab results, doctor diagnoses, 
hospitalization records, and this was tens of millions of people. They never asked the permission. When will people wake up to the fact that Google is the biggest Trojan horse in human history? Dressed up as a wonderful tool of enlightenment and education and advancement. Wonderful! When it's not that at all. Incredible that. Absolutely incredible. 23 minutes past the air. Wall Street Journal broke that to its credit. And that's a developing story uh, last night and today. A lot of coverage, of course, in the United States. Speaking of tech stuff, the Labour Party claimed uh, in the last few minutes that it has been the victim of a second cyber attack. Now, if you've been following this today, they claimed earlier today that they were the party, the party headquarters, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's computer servers were attacked earlier on. And just in the last couple of minutes, it's saying that it happened again. Here's a Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, talking about it. Are, or is the Labour Party being attacked cyberly? The cyber attacks that have taken place uh, took place yesterday against the Labour Party platform. It was a very serious cyber attack. We have a system in place in our office to protect us against these cyber attacks, but it was a very serious attack against us. So far as we're aware, none of our information was downloaded and the attack was actually repulsed because we have an effective in-house developed system by people within our party. But if this is a sign of things to come in this election, I feel very nervous about it all because a cyber attack against a political party in an election is suspicious and something one is very worried about. A cyber attack has happened in 2017 against our National Health Service is something that is incredibly dangerous to the health records and the health care and treatment of potentially millions of people. And so we do need far better defensive arrangements against cyber attacks made against us. As to who undertook the attack, we're looking into all that at the moment and we've obviously reported the, the Russians to the National Cyber Security Centre and they will be investigating it as well. Yeah, he was talking there about an attack yesterday that was thwarted. But another one has been reported by the Labour Party in the last few minutes there. Hmm... Will we have our own Watergate, will we? Will we? We'll have our own Watergate scandal. Maybe we will, maybe uh, we won't. This is the Richie Allen Show, by the way, broadcasting live. First and foremost on richieallen.co.uk. The programme archived on iTunes, Spotify, Podomatic primarily. We're also on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, multiple other platforms as well. And you can get us on YouTube if you like. The programme, of course, is put on YouTube as well. And at 9.30 every morning, that's UK time, 9.30, well, Monday to Thursday, I do a light-hearted run through the UK's newspapers for about 40, 45 minutes every Monday to Thursday at 9.30. If you haven't checked that out before, do check it out. We're coming up to 5.26. Fanola Moss will be live on the programme from Sheffield in a few minutes' time. All righty. Okay. One or two people have reported today that they're trying to listen to me live. Listen, first and foremost, the program is on richieallen.co.uk. Go to the homepage. And on the left-hand side, there is a lovely player. It was made very simple and very easy to use by Hayden Hewitt. If you press play there, the program will play. And it will play good. All right? All right. So there you are number of places you can hear it. Uh, William tweets anything on the Aussie wildfires. Nothing that I, I've got nothing to say that hasn't been said in the in the mainstream media. William, I'm not there, so what can I say about it? I have my suspicions about these fires. I I don't take at face value when we are told that you know the climate and weather patterns and weather systems give rise to these fires. I take it with a large pinch of salt, to be honest. I've, I've interviewed people like Deborah Tavares on the programme many times. Obviously, she speaks from the point of view of the Pacific Coast and the problems they've had there. I have my suspicions, but I can't say anything about what's happening in Australia because I'm not there. See, that's the responsible thing to do. I haven't a clue is the answer, but, but yeah, watching it like yourself on, on the BBC and on Sky. Yes, yes. 
Jason tweets and he alleges, and I didn't hear this, Jason. I didn't, maybe I missed it, my friend, but I'll, I'll take your word. He said that the BBC Emma Barnett broke the cyber attack story on that show this morning. And within a couple of minutes, the Russians were blamed. And that was after her Clinton interview. Will the Russians be blamed for a cyber attack on the Labour Party? Will they? Well, time will tell. 28 minutes past the hour. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Hi to Matthew Phillips. How you doing, Matthew? Hi to Sin Kronos. Hi to Steve James. How you doing, Steve? Uh, to Patrick, to Susan, to Joe Public, who's listening to Paul as well, to Faisal, to Natalie Stacy. Natalie is a musician of ability. I wonder what Natalie makes of the Greta... Well, we shouldn't call it the Greta Thunberg song. She's got nothing to do with it. But Natalie heard military drums in there. Military drums. Well, there is an image in the video of the Houses of Parliament basically in flames. Hopefully nobody in there. I don't know if in the video the Houses of Parliament catch fire because of climate change, but that could be it too, you see. It could be it. Maybe the video creators are not wishing death on our MPs and on our peers. Maybe, just maybe, they're suggesting that if we don't deal with climate change, the climate change itself will, well, it will basically set fire to the House of Commons. Who knows? This is Europe's most listened to independent radio show. My name is Richie Allen. Welcome to it, by the way. Very important story coming up next after Snow Patrol. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. Right, welcome back to the program. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Fanola Moss in about 90 seconds' time. I know there will be a lot of interest in this. So comments, please, to at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to give you an email address for the programme. I will do that tomorrow. And it'll be the Richie Allen Show. It'll be a very simple email address. And I'll be happy to read out fragments of emails. It's easier to send a more detailed comment via email. I'm well aware of that. But it will also be a way for you to reach the programme with stories or bits of information that might be of interest to me and might be of interest to other people. All right, so I will give you that. It doesn't mean that I'll be monitoring it non-stop and that I'll be replying to every email. I will not. I will not. Not because I'm, you know, not because I'm special or important, because I don't have the bloody time to do that. But I will read them um, periodically and pick out bits and pieces. Another thing I wanted to do, and I'm looking at this, I wanted to do this in London years ago, and I'm thinking of, logistically, I think it's very easy to do it now. Because everybody has a smartphone, God damn it, I know. They're not great, are they? They're not great, they're not healthy, but everybody has one. It's very easy now to record yourself for 30 seconds making a comment and to then send me the WAV file or the MP3 file via an email. So this is an idea I've had. I've been thinking about this for a while where we'll do a topic, we'll have a chat about something and I might say to you, hey, listen, if you want to send me your 30-second little rant, send it to me, and provided that you're not libeling somebody, I don't mind a bit of swearing, I'd be a hypocrite if I did. Providing you're not libeling somebody, I'd be happy to run it. So I'm going to do that, I'm going to organize that, and I'll give you more details on that tomorrow. 
That's tomorrow, Wednesday. Are you with me? Are you with me? You understand? Right. Let's talk about something that is very, very serious. And in fact, Sky News covered this last week. And when they did, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a lady on Twitter about a year ago. In fact, just before Christmas last year. And it's about people with learning disabilities and autism finding themselves in care permanently after they turn 18. It's a scandal. So let me read you a little bit of this from Sky News because to give Sky a little bit of credit, they've been all over this. Right, let me just do that. Okay. Sky said, this was on Sky's website last week. Currently, there are 2,250 people that's 2,250 people with a learning disability or autism from England in units with 235 of them under the age of 18. So the majority are over 18. Some 355 people have been in institutions, hospitals for 10 years or more, according to NHS Digital's most recent data for England in September of 2019. And Sky News, again to its credit, revealed last year that 40 people with a learning disability or autism died while admitted to secure treatment units since 2015. And Sky told the story of a man at that time who had spent 19 years in one unit. And last week Sky told the story of Jeremy and a lot of people saw this and it reminded me of Fanola, whom I was in touch with last year and to my discredit, um, lost touch with her because it slipped my bloody mind to get back to her and to talk more about her own story. I'm blaming it on the fact that I don't have a producer or a researcher, it's just me. But anyway, I hold my hands up. And when I was listening to the story of Jeremy and Bethany last week, it rang a bell. And um, Sky told this story about Jeremy, whose daughter Bethany has been locked up for 24 hours a day without any physical human contact contact for weeks and months. She's in a little cell where food is basically pushed through a hatch and slid across the floor. This is a woman, a young woman, right, with, um, with autism. She's got sensory needs, uh, special needs uh, young lady. Um, no furniture in the room except a mattress on the floor that she sleeps on. It, it's, it's horrendous stuff. So I got back in touch with um, my guest. My guest, uh, her name is Fanola Moss. Now, Fanola is a solicitor and a campaigner. And she's got her own story to tell about her daughter, Izzy. And we'll hear about Izzy and what happened to Izzy and why Fanola runs her blog, because I will tweet out links to her blog. I had no idea, because you see, when we hear about people being in the care of the state, we imagine that they are in the care of the state, but they're not. And I was educated by my guest today because in many, many, many cases, they're actually in the care of a private corporation. And in this country, some of these units, as they are known as, are being run by a company in the United States of America. It's not an exaggeration to call it a national scandal. It's not pathos to be trying to get an emotional reaction from your audience. This is absolutely horrendous. How could it be going on? And why, apart from Sky News recently, has the media um, pretty much ignored it? Let's welcome to the programme, live from Sheffield. Uh, she's a solicitor and a campaigner. Delighted to get her on the programme, finally. Let's say hello to Fanola Moss. Fanola, you're very welcome to the programme. How are you? Very well. Very well, thank you. Great to have you on, Fanola. Thanks for, for, for doing it. And I know before we talk about Izzy's case, I know you wanted to give us a general kind of a briefing because it's very new to me, this, and for our listeners it'll be very new as well. You wanted to give us a briefing about why, how you came to find out that autistic people and people with um, intellectual disabilities, many of them, are being used as cash cows by corporations. I know that your own daughter's story has a lot to do with that, but give us a general overview of what is going on in the UK today. Well, basically what's happening is that uh, people like my daughter are actually being taken away from their parents under the Mental Capacity Act, which was passed back in 2005, and they are being put into 
enforced venture capital care homes which are actually being invested in for millions i mean the actual home that my daughter would be sent to was actually sold uh, for what was the figure it was, it was a massive amount of money. I remember you telling me. I read yeah, it in the blog. I remember it. Sorry, 207. No, originally, it was it, in 2016, it was 379 million that United Health Services Hospital, uh, multinational hospital group, it's an American hospital, basically bought up signet mental hospitals and they also bought up all the adult services care packages which for 379 million in 2016 the figures are absolutely huge and the figures are absolutely huge because the actual money that's got for them comes from both the national health service budget and the care budget under the Health and Social Care Act 19, 2012, basically care package money, which is worth millions, and health have been amalgamated together. And this money is now available to venture capital. And these uh, health packages have been um, heralded as the hottest investment for the, of the decade for international buyers and basically you've got the castle holding jersey based company they're all probably not paying any tax because they're all jersey based let's take this step by step finola let's take the because we've got loads of time we had a lovely chat the other morning you and me i've just got a bit confused because no 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 listen we've on, got on all the the, yeah i know that we've got all the time in the world right so i want to take this step by step because the research you've done and people can find this at finolamoss.wordpress.com so do uh, cross-reference what you hear today by going to finolamoss.wordpress.com. Now, and if I say anything, you can just Google my name, Finola Moss, and you can Google the particular act, Mental Capacity Act, and the various ones will come up so you can read them. Now, this is important. So the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, yes. th that gave the state the authority to take... Um, children uh, who become 18 years old if yes. they have autism or or a learning disability to take yes. them into care and the parents could do nothing about that Fanola, because the child is now 18. Yes exactly that's exactly what happened to us we were summoned to the court um, of protection with less than 24 hours notice and basically told that if we didn't agree to any order then our child would be removed that night and it wouldn't as our you know solicitor said it wouldn't be very nice there'd be police there and she would be removed to the facility that they had decided was in her best interests and this is your daughter izzy now t talk to us about uh, izzy by the way what um condition was 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 izzy um coping with and prior to her turning 18 what sort of care would she have received? Because, I, I, again, I know the answers because I've been reading your blog. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so tell us about her before she was 18 and what led up to that decision to take her away. Well, basically, Isabel was diagnosed as on the autistic spectrum, but she had no general learning disabilities at four and she had incredible strengths in various things. And I described her as a bright child and she went to an ordinary primary school and basically was a little hyperactive. She read books age seven when she, um, when she was only five. She did jigsaws upside down. She was very, very good. She could spell everything phonetically that you gave her. And basically... She had problems in that school and one of the teachers slapped her across the face. And then within, well, by the age of seven, she was moved to a mixed disability school, which didn't suit her at all because there were very few autistic there. And then basically um, she had problems there. And the next thing we were referred to was CAMS. And CAMS put her on Risperidol, which is an incredibly 
incredibly, and I've written about Risperidol for Nola Moss. You can Google it. Incredibly powerful antipsychotic, which made her weigh herself all the time and become terribly depressed and put on two stone of weight. And when I asked the psychiatrist to you know why she was getting this, she just gave me um, a conference paper which had been actually paid for by Janssen and Janssen's, the manufacturers. In America, millions has been paid out for the use of respiratory and side effects are absolutely appalling and people are dying and millions have been paid out in America. But we can't sue here because we've got no lawyers, no basic contract with our providers. We have to just rely on the National Health Service as a means of trust. So basically... That's quite amazing that you ask yeah. you ask about this medication and the doctor says to you, here's the survey or here's a study, but the study was actually paid for by the drug manufacturer and in later years in America that drug manufacturer was sued because of the adverse effects of the drug. That's yeah. mind boggling to me that. Yeah, and it, and it was even worse because she gave me a pink slip with the side effects and they were like nausea, um, dizziness stomach pains and I said well she's weighing herself all the time she's crying permanently she's becoming aggressive and she said well they cannot be side effects because they're not on our list so in other words what I'm saying is a rigged trial it was also off label in other words it respiratory isn't prescribed for autistic people it's prescribed only on a very short term it's an antipsychotic so it's supposed to be for psychotic people and on the strength of these trials she had on my daughter at age 10 she'd be nine basically set up multi-million pound centers in sheffield which actually assess people and the only treatment they give them is a respiratory prescription when they leave so these were set up on the back of this trial of Risperidol. So that was poor Izzy. It basically, we found out that the reason why Izzy was distressed was totally physical because she had a poo impaction because of what had gone on in her um, mixed special needs school. And that's like and a buildup of, of feces, of, which is very, very dangerous, very right? Common on the on trauma if any trauma yeah. happens to autistic they can it affects the stomach and they build up feces but nobody they didn't do any health checks on her at all they just weighed her and took her blood pressure and that was it and so i was screaming for some sort of health checks because she was running poo all the time and she was it, it, we couldn't even get nappies incontinent for poo and pee no nappies and then the next thing I complained about CAMS and complained about the respiratory and everything. And the next thing is, was summoned to the care courts in 2007 and they threatened care order to remove Isabel, which of course is very easy for any autistic child because they are not under parental control. They're deemed by their behavior. You can't control them. You can't say, go away, go and eat your food, go into your bedroom, because they take no notice of you because they're autistic. Now, was that a fact, Fanola? Listen, Fanola Moss is our guest. Fanola is a solicitor. FanolaMoss.wordpress.com. You're hearing very important information here tonight. Is that an absolute fact that the parents of autistic children are not deemed to be their legal guardians? Under the MCA, yes, when they get to 18. Oh, when they get to 18, but prior to that, because I'm interested but no, in but that. No, but prior to that, because the care care is so extensive, right. and the definition of care is future, future uh, significant harm. Basically, if you don't agree to anything that they want, they can say that you can cause future significant harm. They can also remove your child if it's, they're beyond parental control and by the nature of autism at times children who are autistic you can i don't know if you can hear a screaming in the background yeah. children of the autistic are actually going to be beyond parental control if izzy goes out and has a meltdown because something happens to him she's on the floor and you can't get her up she's beyond parental control but so because of the law itself at any time the state can take the child because 
the law satisfied. And they recommend courses of action to help children like Izzy, Isabel, when she was younger. And as the parents, you're compelled to go along with that because if you don't, even if you know like Risperidol, even if you know that the drug is harmful, you can't speak up against it because there'll be a care order. Exactly. That's just... And I know you're telling the truth because I've looked into it. I'd love to sit here and argue with you. It happened to us anyway. We wanted Izzy to go on a weekly placement in the National Autistic School because I thought, well, that's going to be the best place nearby. I found the, na- the, the school, unfortunately, wish I hadn't, and basically got in touch with the headmistress. And basically, we wanted a weekly placement so she'd come home here every weekend, yeah. which there is. They took us to court and they would not give us a weekly placement. It had to be a 52-week placement, which cost 177000 a year from the LA. Now, now can, you, can, you be, can you just be mindful of something for me? You know this information back to front, but we don't. So I want you to be specific when you talk about these details, Finola, because they are important. I've read the documentation, so I know you're, you're telling the truth. This is, this is incredible. So they wanted, they said no to weekend um, returning home. Got to be there all year round. And the cost of keeping Izzy was 177000 Who paid that money and who received it? Who receives that money? Who pays it? Who receives it? It was paid by equally uh, split between the local authority, which included care and education, and the National Health service they split it three ways they paid it completely to the national autistic society for that placement and and who is what is the national autistic society what is it is it a private company no it's a charity it's a charity right okay. it recycles its profits charities now are not controlled by anybody and when you say they're not making profit they're run as corporations the only difference is they recycle their profits into their own managers so the school that Izzy went to then so the national autistic society would take the 177 grand and yeah. they would spend it so so the school is private then the school is a charity. All oh, right, excuse me, it's part of the National Autistic, right, I'm with you, society, so it's all part it of... It's actually owned right. by the National Autistic Society. It's owned by the National Autistic Society, fair enough, right, wow. So they said, no, she can't come home at weekends, she's got to be here basically full time. They put her on a 52-week placement, but it got worse because she was never, they said, oh, she'll go there and we'll assess her in six months, but she was never assessed and there was no details of any assessment having ever taken place. And it got even worse because we couldn't get the, the weekly placement. And when, when we went to court, they said, well, if you keep insisting upon it, we will get a care order. So we had to drop it. So when she went, we took her ourselves in our car, which was really, really sad, and then just left her there, never knowing whether we'd ever even see her again. And basically we fought and fought and eventually we were able to take her home three weekends every month and we took her on holidays to Ireland and Menorca. And how how and was she when, when, when she was coming home? Um, how, how was she in, in herself, I mean, by that? Well, at the beginning it was particularly grim because she was bitten twice, two huge bites to her stomach by one of the boys there. And she had a cauliflower ear and she had conjunctivitis of her eye, which she'd never had. So that was during the first year. But it did. And we didn't know whether it wasn't until she went in the September. It wasn't until the November, December that we were allowed to even bring her home for a weekend. And during the first month or so, we didn't even know when we'd ever see her again. So we were absolutely heartbroken. And she's only a little child, 10. And it was terribly sad. And she's thrown from mummy, daddy, sister, Eleanor, into a completely strange place with strange people. Some of them were, they were, it wasn't a suitable place for her. They were far more violent than Izzy was. And that's the position she was in. But then she calmed down. And for a year or two, she was 
not too bad going into class, although she completely regressed. She couldn't write a name. She didn't spell anything phonetically. They did nothing. They didn't read to her. She didn't read any books. She, they didn't even teach her how to brush her teeth or wipe her bum or anything. It was complete regression in personal care. So that was the two years. And then she got to um, 2011 and she had... I think she was about 12, 13, took her to the doctors. We didn't even know she was going in the place where she was. There was the doctors. The doctor, the GP, wouldn't come out to the people in National Autistic Society. They had to be taken there. We couldn't get the doctor to go out there. So she went to the doctors and there's been some form of restraint because she, the doctor kept her waiting for 40 minutes and she tried to escape and they call for backup and she came home that weekend with 48 bruises and we have the body scan now we managed to get it and 48 bruises were noted because she was restrained you think well yes because you see every time she went home from here she was checked for bruises but nothing was done about the 48 restraints except they did a body scan. So we complained and said, how did she get all these? And eventually we went through the social services and everything. And they had a safeguarding meeting, Barnsley safeguarding meeting. And the head of the National Autistic Society School said they were all self-harm. But you and knew better. In, you knew better than that. But places are on the back of the heels. You can see the scan and get the scan in the blog. Um, and there were places that you couldn't self-harm. And Izzy's not a self-harmer. I mean, she'll bang her fists on the floor and roll over and everything. But 48 bruises arising from on one particular day. And she arrived home with them. So that basically triggered very unhappy schooling for two years. And she wouldn't go into the classroom. She wouldn't go out in the coach anywhere. She became totally regressed. And she was pulling her hair out and she was in a shocking state when she came home. So basically, when she got to 15, she was in a shocking state. They brought in cams again and they put her on Prozac. They put, they put her, her on Prozac? Prozac? Yeah, when I read this, yeah. yeah. The Rexetine, Flexetine, the trade name for Prozac. Yeah, the trade name, yeah. yeah. yeah so we took her off, uh, she's on Flexetine. And she was much worse. She was attacking us when we drove her home because we had to drive her back and forth at the weekends. There was a coach that came in here, you know, with the weekly placements that we wanted her on from from the National Autistic Society. But they said they weren't insured to take her. So religiously, every weekend, up three weekends, we would go up, pick Izzy up on Friday and drop her off on Sunday. And one time she actually attacked us in the back of the car and we had to stop at the main thing, ring up for backup and get them to follow us home. And basically we were terrified. Luckily I had the, ten, you know, the clue to actually take a tape recording on my phone. Otherwise, because obviously my husband was wrestling with her in the car and there were bruises on her um, wrists. So I took an actual little video of it on my mobile phone because they were then going to take proceedings against us because of these bruises, even though they knew this had happened. So what I'm saying is she became, but luckily that didn't happen because we showed exactly what happened on a video. This is what you've got to be all the time proactive, thinking that you're going to be blamed for everything, whereas you've got no blame at all against them. So basically, um, she then, because of that restraint, regressed completely and became, I think that was a trigger for post-traumatic stress disorder, which she's being diagnosed as, and she got another poo impaction. But they didn't know she had a poo impaction and they totally denied it and wouldn't have it that she had one. And I was screaming the place down, she's got to have a scan because what happens is they're building, that she was losing weight, she was down to seven stone at five foot six. She pulled all her hair out and she was completely impacted and terribly depressed. Anyway, I've gone off a tangent there. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, no. this is important. It's like, because you're, it's, it's creating a picture 
I, I mean, the impaction, the poo impaction, that, yeah, that, is, a, that is evidence, isn't it, that, that, that people are not taking care that somebody with Izzy's emotional um, problems is having a bowel movement. That's very important. I remember being in hospital many, many years ago um, for, you know, for respiratory problems, for pneumonia and stuff. I remember them being very concerned about bowel movements. Um, you know, I, I, I find it kind of disturbing that she could, because you described to me the other day that the poo was backed up into her body, basically. It was terrible. How could they not know that? How could somebody not realise, oh, by the way, young Isabel there hasn't had a bowel movement. Maybe we need to look at no, it's, something it's we can worse, do. It's worse than that, Richie. They were actually checking. They were checking. They were checking and denying it. And not caring about it. Well, they actually denied it. They actually were saying she hasn't got a poo in patch and there was a nurse, a CAMS nurse, who said, no, she hasn't got a poo in patch. And, and the parents keep insisting she has, making out that we were complete nutters. Tell me this, because listeners will be screaming at us now. Obviously, um, the issues that Izzy has had to deal with, God love her, it could be any of us, could be any of us with a child who has um, the emotional um, difficulties. If I can describe it as more, you, you can shout at me if you want. You say autism, say learning disability. But it, it must be a horrendous strain on the parents to try oh. and deal with that. So what I'm, what I'm coming to is, a lot of people will be screaming at me to be saying, Richie, mention to Fanola, obviously people can't be expected to cope with Izzy. There's got to be an intervention or help from uh, the state. Uh, so, yeah. so, so what are we talking about? Is it that the state is completely incapable of dealing with Izzy, number one, or people like her? Or number two, is it because and we're going to come to this now in a few minutes, is it because of the for-profit nature of it that yeah. they're not really in the business of helping people like Izzy, they're more in the business of making money? What is it? Because you obviously, you and your husband obviously could not cope with Izzy's worst periods by yourself. You needed yeah. that help. Why wasn't that help there? Why did they fail, do you think? Yeah. Well, basically, the major problems, the major thing is that most of Izzy's problems have actually been caused by her state care and mistreatment. She would not be as bad. But you're right, there isn't any support for autistic children because the only support is get diagnosis and then make as much money as you can out of them as possible. We've got Kismal schools, if you read about Kismal, Kismal schools for special needs and the autism was recently sold for 200 million to Road Chef. Now, Road Chef know absolutely nothing about special needs. Who are they now? Who are they, Fanola, Road Chef? They own the, the little chefs on the motorway. So what's happening is the more money they've got, the more they can buy. And all Izzy's are is a huge bonanza for future profit. Because we're, we're now up to where this is, and thank God we have all the time in the world. We're, we're now at the point where we're talking about, they're looking at Izzy and they're yeah. looking ahead to when, when children like Izzy become 18, right? Adults, yeah. Adults, because once they become 18, you, 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 you're, you're, you as a parent are finished in the eyes finished. of the law and they can exactly. do what they want. Yeah. The Mental Capacity Act does not, what it does is it has a test which nobody can pass called the capacity test. And that can actually remove all decisions from the person deemed incapable, i.e. Izzy or anybody with learning disabled disabilities. Even though the autistic are often very clever, I mean, Izzy's never had general learning disabilities, but she's been deemed to have a mental age of three because they do it on an adaptive test, i.e. she can't wipe her bum, she can't brush her teeth, she's got a mental age of three. They don't understand or want to understand the nature of autism. I mean, we've got Einstein who was technically autistic. Yeah. Very, very, very bright people who cannot, it's not that they cannot communicate. Of course they can talk. They don't need speech therapists. Because of their minds, they decide not to for whatever reason. It's a completely different thing about, I can't remember what I was going to say then. 
gone off tangent now. No, no, this is really good. Oh, so, yeah, so yeah. Basically, what we're saying is they're huge cash cows. In America, it's been estimated it's something like 33 billion is going, what they're going to cost. And so everybody's feeding into it in the UK because the money is guaranteed from the state. It's coming out of our deficit, which you probably know, three trillion. That's why, why it's happening. They're making huge amounts of money out of siphoning public money into private venture capital coffers, which isn't even taxed. And they're not, um, there's no accountability for the services. So they're not overseeing the services. So you're not getting any services. What you're getting, and the Labour government did this, the introduction of P scales. Is this not taught to the national curriculum? Labour government created these P scales, which are effectively nothing, that these learning disabilities people are technically tick boxed assessed on, which means the schools don't have to do anything. Then it means National Autistic Society is seeing what happened to Izzy. They don't have to do anything. Then the people at 18 literally just warehouse them out, have itinerant carers. The place where Thomas Rawnsley died hadn't even been, and Izzy would have gone to, hadn't even been inspected by the Care Quality Commission when he was sent there. And then after his death was given a good or an excellent rating by quality Care Quality Control, the overseas local authority and the commissioners will be liable if there's a problem with the care. So basically, they are going to cover up any inadequate care and all the people that provide the care, massive profit margin, because they're getting paid over 9,000 a week for Izzy. I get 62 pounds. 9,000 pounds a week they get. More. That's why, as I said to you, I can't even remember that figure, 209 million. Let me just remind the listeners, 209 million, let's, we'll come back to those figures, uh, because you mentioned Thomas Rawnsley, who died yes. three years ago, and I remember yes. hearing about the story on the programme, and uh, Thomas, God love him, as far as I remember, had Down syndrome, didn't he? He was and 20 when he died, and he had learning disabilities and Downs, yeah. Yeah, he, he had, um, they, they said he was autistic, and he was taken into care, his mum wasn't given access to him she didn't get to be with him when he died um no. the, the, he, he if i remember there was a big issue with um him 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 having his life support machine switched off um yeah. and you've written an article on this about no justice for yeah. thomas ronsley i'll tell you what i want what i want to do we've got um it's eight, it's eight and a half minutes past the hour let me do a quick summing up because we'll have had listeners log on and uh, tune in and join in in the last 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm uh, speaking with Fanola Moss. Fanola is a solicitor and she's live on the line from Sheffield and she's been talking about the difficulty that her family, Fanola's family and Fanola have had getting appropriate care for their daughter, Isabel, who, um, who has autism and she's got very uh, serious emotional problems associated with the autism. And Fanola done an, a, an excellent job of describing um, the difficulties with some of the schools and some of the care um, under the National uh, Autistic Association, National Autistic Society, I should say, and the the lack of real care for Izzy and how in that situation children are often abused, they often turn up with injuries and bruises and there's no answers, um, you know, no satisfactory answers given to the parents. Or, or to the family, and um, we we've kind of we, we we talked about that. We talked about the Mental uh, Health Act of two thousand and five, which um, was 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 hugely important in terms of this story because it gave the state basically the right to intervene and take children away from families with uh, without the consent of the family. But more importantly, when the children do reach adulthood, when they turn eighteen. The parent loses all responsibility for the child and the state can step in at that point then and say, right, um, we're going to take the child into care. And what, 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 we're, what, what, what we're building up to, I suppose, here is something that you've been writing about in your blog. You've called it um, the silent holocaust. Yeah. And you can read this on fanolamoss.wordpress.com. You talked there a minute ago about how the company that operates Little Chef 
has been buying homes, spending hundreds of millions because of the amounts of money that the government is prepared to spend with these private companies they're, they're, to deal they're, with this. They're, they're buying up the schools. They're buying up the schools, excuse me. But what they're doing is they're adding on homes after 18. You know, they're expending the, you know, they're building them. Yeah. Let's go back to, let's go back to that, that, that um, cash cow. How children and young adults with, with autism and with learning disabilities are seen to be for big corporations, a cash cow. And you've written yeah. extensively about how overseas companies are getting involved in this. And I want you to tell this story because it's going to, people are going to, people are going to be gobsmacked when they hear this. Because when I started reading into it and looking into it in the last couple of uh, weeks, I couldn't believe my eyes. So talk to us about that then. Why it's a, it's a silent holocaust and why children are being seen as cash cows. How are people with learning disabilities and with autism, how are they basically serving custodial sentences in private corporation uh, run facilities? How has that come to be? Well, basically it's the huge amount of money that is available from the, na um, from the National Health S Service. In other words, if you're in a locked up ATU, adult treatment unit, then the um, NHS pay 13,000 a week. And in a forensic assessment unit, 3,000 a night to assess you, to get you into one of these places. Right, so how did that come to be farmed out by the NHS? Why are these children not being dealt with by NHS general practitioners or NHS specialists? This is what killed me when I read this. I couldn't believe it. I tore out what little bit of hair I have on my head. How does the <laughs> NHS give, and I'm not saying that for a giggle, how does it give thousands to a company to do that? How does that happen? I can't understand it. Well, the law behind it is the Health and Social Care Act 2012, which basically says that the uh, took control of all NHS funds and gave them to NHS England, whose head is an ex-director of the huge American United Health Services, who were then, he's the ex-director, he was um, an executive in America for eight years after advising Blair on public services. Then he came back to become head of NHS England. And under the Health and Social Care Act, they got all that money, that money, if you read the act, all parties voted for it, they've effectively given away the NHS. So they've given it away to NHS England, and then NHS England can then pay out any amount they want under their clinical care commissioning groups locally. It also includes care as well. So massive budget of health and massive budget of care to plough into these places which are not monitored and which they don't, there's no transparency as to what they're doing because... Hang on a second, Fanola, hang on a second. So, so NHS England is a private company then? No. Cause, cause, let me just repeat no, what you said. It's not a private company. It, it is the NHS, but... It's been sold, if you read my blog post, Health and Social Care um, Scavenged, my latest one, it's been by statute given to Simon Stevens and a yeah, commissioning yeah. group which is known as NHS England. And then the commissioning groups locally decide what money is going to go to each particular private care package. Very good. You've explained it brilliantly. So the Health and Social Care Act made all this possible. That NHS Yeah, funds. it made it all possible by law so they're not private. The, the actual NHS England's not private, but it's not a body, it's a commissioning body. It controls the money, siphons it through their commissioners, and then it hits the huge private. Now this is important. So so these commissioning groups then they're not looking to go to the academic institutions of the UK and train men and women to come to come to work for the public, to work for the NHS, to learn how to care for children like Izzy. They're not doing that. They're giving well, the money to private corporations to do it. Yeah, and the private corporations then make a massive profit because they're not effectively doing anything except to warehouse and drug. Because every... You know there's three a day dying. 
It's mainly on polypharmacy. They're all put on antidepressants and antipsychotics. And if you read the St. Andrew's stuff that I've written, we had four dying in a ward of eight coughing up salt in terrible state. Nobody bothered about them. They're being certified as dying of natural causes. We've got completely com com complicit government who's actually making it a lot easier for them to do it because they're basically um, created a role of medical examiner which usurps coroner in a lot of cases so very few are now going to coroner's inquests so just dying of natural causes being certified as dying nobody has a central record of the number of deaths there isn't an actual number you're telling me there isn't a central record kept to the number of deaths all there is is a duty to tell the Care Quality Commission and people have found out that some of the deaths have not even been told to the Care Quality Commission. And what you've got to remember is these private people can hide behind Freedom of Information Act notices on the grounds of commercial confidentiality. Commercial confidentiality. Commercial confidentiality. Because it's a commercial enterprise. Get exactly. as many children as you can, aged 18. Yeah. that um, have autism or learning disability, get them warehoused. You see, this stinks to me. It, it, it's very much like when in the United States, massive corporations like the Corrections Corporation of America were given licenses by states like Texas and Alabama and Louisiana to run prisons. But, yeah. but the states, uh, Fanola, also agreed that they would keep them at 98% occupancy. It's quite yeah. staggering. They said, w would you, 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 you bid to run our prisons? And they did. And they said, right, we'll give you X amount of money to run our prisons. And we'll also guarantee you that they'll be full. And I'd be very interested in what sort of agreements some of these private healthcare companies that are warehousing the, the intellectually disabled and autistic, what sort of agreements have been made between these, um, as you described them, uh, uh, commissioning groups uh, what agreements are there between the commissioning groups and the private companies I mean are they guaranteeing them that they're going to find as many 18 year old autistic children as they can to fill these units they must exactly. be Jesus isn't, Christ they two, must be there's two, thing, there's two things too that uh, increase the chance that this has got to happen these people are actually Izzy is actually a commodity that is f funding and increasing England's GDP. So the more profit these private companies get, the higher our GDP is and looks as if our country's doing well. So there's that, there's that element of it and there's the element that you can't find out the money and what the services are because freedom of information behind freedom of information and the long-term contracts, they are the only people that get the package. Poor old Paula Ronsley had a place in Bradford near her by her that was another package. She couldn't get the money for it. it had, she had to be taken to Sheffield because under the Health and Social Care Act, it's only qualified providers. So basically the commission decide if there is only one qualified provider and they pay them. It's a cartel, basically. And there's no way of checking up how long the contracts are for, what they're for, and how much is being paid out. Or more importantly, the outcomes for the people subject to the contracts. The parents can't talk out, they're all gagged. You're gagged on any services. I can't talk about any services Izzy gets because it won't be in her best interests. So you're gagged by the court of protection. So the parents can't talk out and the parents would be excluded from even seeing them anyway if they were to complain or talk out. And obviously the, the patient can't because they're incapable anyway. Let me get this straight. So thousands of young men and women are warehoused in the UK in 2019 and they are warehoused in facilities run by private corporations, including American ones. Um, God knows what is happening to those young men and women. We can't know because of commercial confidentiality. You can't use freedom of information uh, uh, requests. There are children, well, young men and women dying in these places. Sky News found this out, to their credit. In the last few years, 40 people dying um, in, in one of these facilities. 
But you can't find any of that out. You can't get the absolute minute detail about what's going on. It's worth yeah. mega bucks to the corporations um, who yeah. run the facilities. And the parents are left wondering, um, saying prayers, um, helpless in the face of complete and utter apathy by the political class because you've tried to get political interest in this and they don't oh, give that, a damn. Yeah, I emailed Norman Lamb when he was in um, National Autistic Society School before she, she voted with her feet. She refused to go back one weekend. That's why she's here. And she's only here because I got a blog and they're basically frightened. And that's it. But she could have been you've, the mental. You see, you've got to distinguish between the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act. At any time, these people can be sectioned under the Mental Health Act at any age and sent anywhere in the country. And the NHS will pay 13000 a week. That's what happened to Bethany when she was locked in her cell. That can happen at any time. And the owners of the hospitals, mainly Signet and the Priory, are both American. And the Signet group has bought up, that's that figure I gave you, the Signet group has then bought up the Cambian adult services where Izzy would go so that they can bounce them whenever they feel like between the actual community ones and the local level. These are portrayed as their own homes and they're moving to the community. The people coming out of all the adult treatment units that's been such a lot of publicity about, the the ones like Winterbourne View and uh, Wurlow Dale Hall, people coming out of them never get home to their parents. They are can only ever go to places like Cambion. And that's why the hospital corporation has bought those places up because it's got the monopoly then. They've got a monopoly. Let me read a few tweets. Faisal tweets, Jesus, over 18s warehoused by criminal scams at £9,000 per person a week and all due to the Mental Capacity Act. Faisal has summed it up there. Here's a very sinister thought. I've had it and it's been articulated by Susan on Twitter. It's, it's occurred to me, but you know what, Fanola, when you say this stuff, people think, well, that's an outrageous thing for a radio guy to say. He shouldn't say that, but I'm going to say it anyway. Susan is saying it. They're being guinea pigged for big pharmaceutical companies. Some of, of them. Course. Medical treatments and so on. I've seen oh, it. Yeah. So, so this is it. So, so you actually have the spectre where private... Act- go on, go on. You, you, you know, go ahead. They're, they're, they're worse than Mendel's rats, as I put in the thing. They can try out, and the Mental Capacity Act, if you read my stuff, they can actually try out any experiment on these people that they want to. And there's little oversight of those experiments. Parents don't get told because they're 18 now, they're deemed to be adults. If they pass the Euthanasia Act, they could euthanise them. You know, the country is big on euthanasia. I will say this, though, um, and I'm I'm, I'm not saying this just to be glib. They won't want them to be euthanised, will they? Because at £9,000 per week... No, but they might want to euthanise them to cover up their terrible To cover up what they're doing to them, yeah. Exactly, because this is one of my terrible fears of Izzy, that basically, if they deem your quality of life, you would yourself make the decision to kill yourself. Because they're making every decision for you, they can decide to kill you. It's as simple as that. And had they passed that euthanasia act that they've been at for years, they could have done this with Izzy or any anybody. You're a woman of the law. Do you find yourself yeah, shaking been, your head sometimes? Truth. 30 years and uh, I've seen what you know what they've done over those 30 years and it's really horrific that they want to make commodities out of the public not only make them earn money but their money is their own money it's our money this is coming out of public funds which we haven't got this is on the back of austerity and it's causing trillions deficits so we're living on huge debt all they're doing is siphoning off non-existent money into private venture capital coffers which they're not even taxing at the expense of three a day deaths i mean it couldn't be worse you think three people are dying a day no there's a a thing you can see from mencap in 2013 when they said there were three a day learning disables dying in the hands of the state. And you know, when it's three a day, you know that some of that has got to be because of abuse. It must be. Well, it's because of... Some of it, 
anyway. poly, poly pharmacy. It's because of the effect of drugs. These people, my daughter's as fit as a flea. She's got my constitution. She's terribly healthy. And you see these healthy autistic people in wheelchairs and they can't walk. The actual, I think I can't remember, but I think it's 40 is the mortality age. They're all dying. It is a, a holocaust. They are dying of polypharmacy. They're poisoned. They're, they're poisoned to death, basically. And basically, nobody goes near their physical issues. These scans that Izzy had when she was full of poo, I tried to get one when she came back here because she got this second poo impact, impaction, all denied. So I went and said, can she have a scan like she had when she was, can't remember, uh, 10. And they said, oh, no, we don't do them after 18. We don't do them. Well, we, now we know why, don't we? Can I just interject there? One of the greatest living Irish, Irishmen is John Lonergan, who used to be the governor of Mount Joy Prison in Dublin. Um, you, you won't know him, Fanola, but one of the greatest humanitarians that ever lived. He saw the prisoners in his uh, charge as human beings that needed to be helped and rehabilitated, a saint on earth. And I often had him on the programme talking about the reason why privatising prisons is a terrible thing. And John said it comes down to a simple thing. You're given a company that exists for profit. The, you're given them the care of men and women. They're not going to spend money on helping uh, those people, on getting them back on their feet. On, and it's the same in Izzy's situation or in some child with autism who turns 18. If a corporation is given £9,000 a week, they want to keep most of that bloody money for themselves. Particularly if the contract's guaranteed for years. For We've years. got the same with our roads in Sheffield, under Army, under the LA. 15-year contracts. And you've got to remember, prisons here are now private. £36,000 is what they get per inmate. And that's why the prisons are in such a state. And they give them terrible food. They keep them locked up for 22, 23 hours a day. And some, and many of them, of course, are non-violent prisoners. So they they're, in a be- they're in a better position than Izzy's. If they anybody are, yeah. dies, they're in state detention and there's got to be an automatic inquiry. There's no state detention in these places. You've, That's you, little- you've described, by the way, it's Fanola Moss from Sheffield, solicitor. The mother of Isabel, who we've heard once or twice in the background there. She sounds like she's peaceably having uh, a bit of fun there in the background, um, um, Fanola. <laughs> and um, what you've described on Fanola uh, Moss.wordpress.com, Fanola Moss.wordpress.com, you've described an episode, and I'm not, again, I'm not being glib, I'm not being funny. You've described the Hammer House of Horrors. This is, I, I cannot believe we're living through this. It's horrible when you're the mother of a beautiful child who's absolutely gorgeous and pretty and everything you could ever want, perfectly healthy, and you've got to think, I'm going to die and think that she's going to have no teeth in a wheelchair. Absolutely horrific because at the moment we've got problems with her teeth and she may have to have an awful lot removed and she'll lose her pretty smile and that it's like killing it's like really emotionally i know it's not you know it's her teeth but she's a pretty little girl well she's pretty 22 year old and it's desperately sad no she's but 22 and she and listen I, I hope that she won't lose all her teeth i hope i hope you'll be okay there she's 22 now so, so she's she's gone over 18 mm. um is that a concern for you now, four years after she passed 18? I yes. mean, do you, do you worry that she, she might deteriorate? You mentioned meltdown. I don't want to be, again, sounding crass, um, but you said meltdown, so I'll say meltdown. She might have an episode, and you worry that in that instance they could come along and say, well, that's it now. No, they can come along any day, any moment, and remove her now. Once you get to 18 and you're deemed incapable then basically they can do whatever they want in that person's best interest. Now, how have you avoided that? Is she doing well, is he? No. I've avoided that purely by my blog and purely because I can only assume that they're frightened. I don't have avoided that. I've been to the... I did my own... uh, litigation and went up to the Court of Appeal twice and what they're doing under the Mental Capacity Act anyway is illegal and they're totally ignoring the Human Rights Act and totally ignoring the actual Mental Capacity Act and what it actually says. It's a huge scandal and basically I've managed to avoid it but Izzy could go at any moment. That's a terrible reality that I live under and she will go to the place where Thomas Rawnsley died and there hasn't even been an inquest into his no death inquest. after five years. So it, you, you're talking 
certain maybe death. I mean, Izzy could have died twice anyway when she was 10 with an impaction when she was 15, 16, when she was an impact, impaction, if it hadn't been for us screaming the place down. So it's a terrible, terrible predicament. And there's no support or no care or nothing. As you've seen, when we did get care before she was 18, we had eight in my blog, surreptitious attempts to try to get her. Somebody accused me of a, a red mark the size of a fist when we got the doctor in. There's absolutely no marks on his in. This is what you're up against. You're up against this 436 million given to the local authority to, to do safeguarding under the Carers Act. And that money is being pen, paid spying on anybody that can be removed. I'm not talking just mentally like is he disabled you're talking about all the old people as well you know anybody under that act can be taken away they're being farmed off into old age so homes. hang on so hang on a second the same entities in the same corporations are getting a hold well we know because richard branson is really involved he, he loves no, this no. virgin loves this virgin care so so oap's homes are now um being taken over by the same corporations well, no, no old age pensioners homes, because if you're deemed incapable under the act, they yeah. can put you, sell your house and put you anywhere. And it gets worse because May, the only other legislation besides Brexit that May put through before it all went pear shaped was to convert liberty safeguards in the Mental Health Act. And these liberty safeguards are not what they say. You don't need to go to the court of protection anymore and somebody can be removed at 16, not 18. And it's the local authority, the executive that decide whether or not it's in your best interest to go to the, these places. So what I'm saying is they've even taken it away from the hands of the courts that they created in the first place to do that because the courts were fed up with just rubber stamping. So under May's liberty safeguards, they've replaced deprivation of liberty orders and your child can be removed at 16 and you don't they don't have to go to court. So it's getting more and more frightening and there's no right to a, a, a jury in an coroner's inquest at all now if you're held under no coroner's inquest no jury and this is not well, about it, a, you could technically get an inquest but a lot of them are being signed off by these latest medical practitioner control role but you can get an inquest but you you're not got no right to a jury in the inquest under your right to liberty you know your human right to liberty in a prison you do because you're in state detention you're no longer deemed to be in state detention if you're kept in a care home under a deprivation of liberty order and the deprivation of liberty order is now being renamed liberty safeguards in the mental health act that may's pushed through the amendment to the mental health act the only legislation and basically they can be decided on by the executive. So we have got a leg to stand on. Isabel's been declared incapable. Any moment now, they can just come and take her away in her best interests. We have no say in what happens to her best interests. All we have is consultation. They tell us what's happening to her. And then if we visit, then if they decide our visits are not in her best interests, we can be excluded which is what's happening from even visits. It's happening to quite a few people because, again, re reading the blog. And these, if we had access, you and me, I mean, you're uh, a solicitor, but your, your writing on these issues is brilliant. It's very, very succinct and, and, and very clear. You write with great clarity. No, you really do, you know. I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about you to make well, the assumption. Well, read the one about what's happening to the NHS, because that's really terrible. I've tweeted out a link to the blog, and um, I'm recommending that people go there and read it, because I reckon if we had access to the sorts, you know, the sort of research teams that we would need, the acts that passed Parliament that enabled private corporations to kidnap children and to warehouse them so that they can be paid £9,000 a week. If you go back in time, of course, this Blair's um, New Labour has a lot to do with this, of course, and then David Cameron's Conservative um, 
government, his coalition, coalition. government, his coalition with the Lib Dems. But I'm reckoning, we, again, we need the forensic researchers. But obviously, a lot of foreign money and big corporate money has lobbied for those acts to be obviously debated and then passed through Parliament and the Lords. Follow the money, but you need the teams to do it, don't you? You need the forensic examiners. I mean, I know you know this in your bone marrow, but that's how these things come about. Politicians are idiots. They don't think up these things. Oh, I'll tell you what we'll do. And it's deliberate. Players done it deliberately. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what's worse is they pushed out more legislation to Blair and Brown than they've ever done in the whole history of the world. And most of it is absolutely crap legislation. I mean, I've written The Fool of Law, which is basically what the Mental Capacity Act is. See, the fundamental principle in law is it's got to be certain. If you if law is not certain, then the populace is at the whim of an arbitrary executive. You, you, can, you haven't got a clue what the law is. And they can make it up as they go along and the courts can make it up. So the rule of law says law must be certain. So when you draft it in an act, you've got to make sure that you put down certainly what you mean by every definition. They didn't do that in the Mental Capacity Act. It's absolutely appalling. They just did everything. They pretended they were passing it to give autonomy to people like Izzy, to give them choice. And they did exactly the opposite. And they drafted it, section one, as a huge, big one section of what was going to happen. And they didn't put anything else in. They just put a huge code of conduct and so what I'm saying is it's so badly drafted that the courts themselves can then decide decisions which are effectively, you know, what they want. The executive can take over and tell the courts what to do because we've got no separation of powers in this country. There is no separation between the political executive, the courts and the legislative legislative are all doing woolly woolly things that they're pushing through nobody understands them health and social care act again is a huge example of that mca and then the courts are interpreting according to how they're told to by the executive so it, 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 legally from a legal perspective i'm absolutely gobsmacked really gobsmacked and the public are completely in <laughs> completely oblivious yeah, ignorance, to it. total ignorance of the whole thing. well why they, wouldn't they be you know you hear the something the nhs yeah. needs yeah. money that means they get more money just to make more private profit they don't need money they're being squoze the ones they want to take over they drive them into the ground and then they buy them up for nothing and then they get more money for them and that money goes in profit and it's not check what the services are. It's not just the odd contract to Virgin. It's the whole structure of the NHS is destroyed. It's been given away already. It doesn't exist anymore. That's what people don't understand. And when you hear things like, let's... Let's leave. I'm, I'm, I've always been in favour of leaving the European Union, so we'll just leave that to one side for a minute. But, but I'm not stupid That's either. Globalisation. They don't want. You see, the Euro, European Union leads to globalisation, and this is the problem. All our mental hospitals are now owned by America. All of them. Perhaps, well, three quarters of them are owned by the Priory, which is owned by Acacia, Acadia, and then. Signet, which is owned by Universal Health Services, and then the place these are our, these are our private mental hospitals you're talking about now, ones that people would have to pay for themselves, or they they don't pay for them. Ninety eight percent of all income in those hospitals is NHS money. Is that right? What they did was they actually got the huge amounts of money that Kate um, Moss used to play in the Priory. They bought at the Priory and thought, wow, yeah, 13000 is what Kate Moss is going to pay. And they're charging that amount of money for Beth and for Izzy and for those people going into them. So they are actually own 98% of the income that's paid to those private bodies is NHS. They're operating, operating. I mean, lots of places are operating under NHS logos and they're all private. The people that come into my kitchen... Ha- 
Sheffield Health and Social Care was a foundation trust which two years ago was converted to a private company and all the people who are working for the NHS as directors were converted automatically into private directors. Nobody in Sheffield knows. I only know because I Google them and, and, and it's in the star. Because you're able to research it. So, so we have the spectre, the horrifying reality now that the National Health Service is not running its own hospitals, it's not hiring and firing its own doctors and using the money that it is given through, you know, public taxation through the government. It's not doing that. It's using NHS England, who's using other, you, you talked about commissioning groups, and they are farming out to private interest, private corporations that work. They're not doing it themselves. We, do you know what? 99 out of 100 people listening to this will not, well, they will believe it, but they will be absolutely gobsmacked. They'll be saying, I thought you get sick, you know, no matter what, whether it's psychological, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, you go to your NHS, you go to your local hospital and you're looked after. They have no idea how much of that care these days is being provided by a private corporation. And you've explained how it happens. It's also also your care homes and also your yeah. dentists. Your dentist. My dentist. My dentist, oper- that's right. And they, it's operating yeah. under the air. It took my tooth out. I mean, a perfectly healthy big molar. Never had a tooth out in my life because they wanted to put a screw in one because they do them as well and make a fortune. My dentist is private and nobody knows that. And it is headed up by the ex-head of Serco. Head of Serco. Yeah, you can read that blog post and yeah, he's taken... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, obviously people don't know. And what annoys me is... Would they um, do anything if they knew Fanola? Would people do anything? This is the thing that... Because there, there are expressions of outrage on Twitter now. But what are we going to do about this? You can't get the so-called socialist Jeremy Corbyn to give an arse about this. Because he doesn't. Because he's not a real socialist. Doesn't give a damn. It was his... He was in... He wasn't in government, but he was a Labour backbencher when this was going on. Did he, have, did he have anything to say about it? Of course he didn't. Of course not. He's a champagne socialist, multi-millionaire Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn couldn't give an arse. Went to a private school, couldn't give a damn. That's what you're dealing with. Taking adults, kidnapping people who have intellectual disability issues, they've got autism, kidnapping them, locking them up like that. I mean, when you saw that story on Sky last week about Bethany, did it give you yeah. some hope, like... Because, I mean, I immediately thought of you when I saw that. Honest to God. And and, and like, and then I, I looked for an opportunity to retweet you. I didn't want to go back to you and say, Fanola, yeah. do you want to come on the radio? Because I thought you'd tell me to fuck off, excuse my language. I, I really did. I thought you'd say, I, we spoke a year ago and I, I, I completely I forgot really about it. But, but I saw Bethany and I thought, Jesus, Fanola. When you saw that on Sky, did you think, right, something might come of this? Well, no, because... That is all propaganda. We've got Winterbourne, Whirlowdale Hall. The only movement is to get people out of mental health hospitals. And the only place they go is the place that they're going to put Izzy where Thomas Rawnsley died. So it's just a movement from the mental health hospitals. And obviously the people who own them are canny enough to know that. So they are bought up the community care, whatever you want to call it, where these people go is just an other institution. So they're in institutions for life. Tony Blair was Maggie Thatcher on steroids, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Well Tony Tony Blair was just completely corrupt. A psychopath, but yeah, but but he was he was Thatcher on steroids. Thatcher believed in selling off the family silver. Yeah, sell off Sa- everything and Blair went much, Yeah, it's much worse than Thatcher. Oh worse, of course he is, on steroids, that's what I mean. He he said he said to Thatcher, I'll see your privatization and I'll raise it. No, they they privatised, but it's worse than that because the Labour voted for it, Liberal Democrats voted for it. They all voted for it. They voted to privatise the whole of the NHS by the Health and Social Care Act 12. And you can read about that in the blog. And that's what's really, I don't know what you do. You have to repeal that act, first of all, and you have to repeal the MCA. And you have to take autism and learning disabilities out of the MHA mental disorder so they can't be sectioned so easily and then you might have a little bit of hope but the moment when Bethany gets out the only place for her 
It's the same place that Izzy's got where Thomas Rawnsley died. It's another institution. And Thomas's family are still in the dark as to what really happened to him. They don't well, know. I'm pretty sure they know. If you look at my blogs, the only reason why there's so much out on Thomas, uh, poor old Rawnsley was, Paula was gagged and she had to remove her Facebook post. But I cannily had copied it and stuck it and put it in my blog posts. And then it was removed. There's complete silence. Everybody goes to jail, God knows what, if they speak out on this. This isn't North Korea. It's funny, isn't it? When they talk about regimes, makes me laugh. Everything is a regime if it's not England. England is perfect. We have a regime in Syria. We have a regime in North Korea. I don't know what's going on in North Korea, only what I'm told in the media. And I don't believe what I'm told is going on in Syria. This is a regime that out, it out disgraces any country in the world. What you've been telling me. It's totalitarian Britain. It applies to everything. It's not just this. We can't have different opinions about anything. There's a group think. All there is is you're either you're either like Bush said, with us or against us. And God help you if you dare to even show that you might be slightly of a different opinion from the big group. That's why we have leaders and followers who don't have individuals anymore. We've had twenty years of having to be a leader or a follower, and if you don't want to be a leader, you don't want to be a follower, you're an enemy. Oh, I don't know where to leave this, to be honest. I don't know what to <laughs> say. I, I, because I, 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 what, what, do, what, do, what do I say to somebody like you, Finoli, you've told me that you have, you have um, Isabel there at home with you. Yeah, and, and, she's, and, 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 gone to sleep. She's, she's up sometimes 28 hours, but I'm really pleased that, you know, that you've allowed me to have a talk, and it really is awful how ignorant and people, it is like the silent holocaust because people can't close their eyes because it could be them next. We all get old, we all, they knocking on the door and you're in a home and you've got your liberty removed and you're stuck on drugs to kill you. The old people is exactly the same, that's all I've got to look forward to. And then basically... All the young people were being... And education, academies. Academies are owned by private companies as well. Our education system. Universities are charities, but they can charge what they like, charge 9,250, and there's no check on what they do. Christ almighty. I know Panorama looked into the abuse committed in care facilities. And I know they've done it a couple of times. And I know some of the facilities were facilities where vulnerable people with um, mental disorders. And that's the, that's the frustrating thing about the media. They only go so far. Sky went so far. BBC Panorama went so far. But they don't start to look beyond the abuse of the, of, of, of the child or the abuse of the senior citizen. They don't look at how we got to this point. That must be frustrating for you, Fanola. You know, they'll cover that aspect of it, which is important. People should know. But then they don't go further. You've got to keep digging and digging and digging. You've been digging for years. It's worse than that, Richie. If you read, I think I've written it, uh, Winterbourne View and Fanola Moss, just Google it, you will see that the Care Quality Commission, the um, managers... The police had known about Winterbourne View for, I think it was up to two years before they went in and exposed it. So what I'm saying is Panorama are not going to spend all that money going and exposing it unless they know they're going to see something terrible. It's as bad as that. Then you have to ask yourself, why are they doing that? They're doing that because they want to try and move all these people under the transforming care agreement uh, that they put forward to their locality, to the places where Izzy would go. They want to move them there and have them in a similar institution under the Mental Capacity Act for life. So there has always been a media push. And ironically, Winterbourne, they ploughed, you can read the the blog post, they ploughed millions in and they uh, asset stripped it and they sold it for a knockdown price of 35 million. Originally, it had been bought by Castle back in masses of money for Winterbourne. They sold it knockdown price for 33 million to Dan Shell. 
and Danshaw were then the owners of the second Panorama scandal six years later. So they actually sold it to the second abusers for 35 million. So in other words, even when this scandal exposed, all that happens is venture capital make even more profit out of that scandal. But that's what the BBC hasn't done. That's the point I was making. I agree with you 100%. They haven't followed up on it. They haven't taken any steps to really expose how it is possible to happen in the first place. Because exactly. it's, it's shock value, isn't it? It's shock because we all sit there we're all human beings, we watch it, and we're genuinely moved to tears. Nothing worse than seeing somebody who can't look after themselves being bullied or pushed around or treated badly by an orderly or by a nurse. It's heartbreaking. And that's the shock value, but that's only the that, tip of the that, iceberg. That, that little girl under the chair is just like it. Oh, horrendous, horrendous. I so we're, we're watching that, and I can't remember, is it probably be a similar age, and she's in, being abused in the National Autistic Society, and we know that that's could happen to her and we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. No parent could because basically we'd be banned from seeing her anyway. And if it caused any complaint and what we'd be gagged because you gagged under the Mental Capacity Act. Under the Mental Capacity Act, everything's in secret. So And you can't get any statistics and you can't find anything out because if you go for the FOI, the Freedom of Information, there's a corporate thing you talked about earlier on, they don't have to give you the information. I mean, I, I can't believe it. What would you like? I, I've, I've tweeted out a link. I, I'd like people to follow Fanola on Twitter. Um, it's at Fanola Moss on Twitter. It might be underscore Moss. Let me just double check that now. Don't worry. Anything to do with me is Fanola Moss. I'm yeah, it is. It's at Fanola it. Moss on Twitter. It is at Fanola Moss. And yeah. it's Fanola Moss.wordpress.com. Fanola Moss.wordpress.com. There's a lovely picture of Izzy there. Um, what you can just do is anything to do. You can just say the word Winterbourne View Fanola Moss and it comes up in Google. And you can just go into it, you know. Is there anything we can do before we finish up for today? I know we'll talk again in the future. I know we will because this is not, you know, this is not going to go away. But is there anything you'd like people who've listened to it to do? Is there anything they can do? I mean, short of picking up the phone and speaking to their local MP who doesn't give a shite anyway, what could they do? Uh, I don't know. I think you yeah. just have to open your eyes, see what's actually going on and basically try to uh, understand other people because we've got we've, we've lost an awful lot nobody we're all turning into emoticons nobody my poor daughter I've got a daughter who's um 20 and of course she's been terribly affected by living in this household o levels a levels everything and she her friends no nobody wants to know and i think people have to know People have to realise, you know, what's going on with other human beings and not turn a blind eye and stop people being used as commodities for profit and wonder where all the money is going and ask where it is going and what it's going on. Tell me this, do you look after yourself? Not really, no. <laughs> no, uh, we, we try, but I mean, you can imagine the terrible... It's cumulative, I mean, it's going. it's been going on now since her diagnosis effectively one huge big um horror and fight with the authorities and and that's it really you know can i can i come down to sheffield in a couple of weeks time and take you out to lunch can i definitely you do that rich you do whatever you want pal yeah let's do that yeah because yeah it's according to me listening to izzy there in the background she's gorgeous and, and everything i doubt you get much time to do anything do you well, no, you, you can't. We can't yeah. go anywhere as a family because we have nobody, no respite. We would pay people to come in, but as you've seen from the blog, even the people we've paid have been hijacked by the state by the for state. safeguarding issues. So we don't trust anybody, even if we could get somebody, because the care world is one huge, big monopoly. Everybody. That's why they won't speak out. The poor carers, because they lose their jobs. They're all zero hour terrified. Folks, go to fanolamoss.wordpress.com. This is beyond the national scandal. This is as evil as it gets. Well, is thank it? you, Richie, for everything. Come over and have a, a lunch or something. You see what no, I will. I will. I'll be. I'll, 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 I'll drop you um, a, a, a message. Um, you have my um, mobile phone number anyway, so I'll drop yeah. you a text and I'll pop down. It'd be lovely to meet you face to face. 
And okay. um, um, listen, I'm not trying to score any points by saying that. It's just occurred to me that you could probably do with an afternoon now and a bit of lunch and a glass of wine. So I'm going to treat you. And that's oh, the end of it. You see, this is exactly, you know, the problem. Nobody actually thinks to do anything like that. That's the problem. You know, I've had, I've helped people an awful lot, you know, with things and, and they got in touch with me, but they never even say, how's this he doing? Or yeah. anything. Which is or how are you doing? Because like, you know, yeah. what what prompted that thought was I could hear Izzy, and she's obviously verbal, and she's 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 talking, and she'll shout from time to time. Um, okay. I've known I've known uh, people who who have had Izzy's difficulties, so I know the strain it puts on it the yeah. parent. How, despite that, that you love her with every fibre of your being, um, and um, yeah, so no, I, I, I'll be only it's, it's, delighted it's to very, do that. It's very, very, very much unconditional love because you can't you can't be too upset with autistic people because they're oversensitive, not undersensitive. That's not so their fault. She, huh? she picks up everything if I'm upset about anything, or if I get angry about anything, she'll pick it up. You see, and it's terribly difficult because you've got to maintain. You, know, you do, but you need a break from it too, don't you? Oh yeah. You need a break. Listen, thanks for giving us your time. Oh, I, thank I, you I very much. Should have had this conversation this time last year, but listen, uh, it was to seen. I'm glad we've had it. Eventually. I'm glad we had it, and I know we'll talk about uh, these issues again. All the very best now, and um, I'll be in touch real soon, and. Uh, um, we'll 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 meet up very soon. We'll have a chat face to face. It'd be an honour to meet you. And thanks, Vanola. Thanks for thank doing it. Thank you very much for your time, Richie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. You bye -bye. too. Bye for now. That was um, Fanola Moss. Fanola is a solicitor and a campaigner, and she's got um, a daughter called Izzy who's got autism, a learning disability, and and it's severe at times. And Fanola was talking about how um, legislation over the years in in this country has privatised the care for children like Izzy. And I'm not going to just sum, sum up the whole thing again. You've heard what we've been talking about there. But how decisions were made that lead to the state having the capacity to say to families, we're going to take the child. Um, this happens a lot when the children turn 18 because they're deemed to be adults. And they are now um, wards of the state that the parents no longer have responsibility and the children are basically put into facilities. They're run by international corporations. Those corporations get thousands and thousands of pounds uh, a week to look after, allegedly, these children. And it is rife and it is rank with corruption from the get-go. And I'm not going to uh, do uh, an injustice to Fanola by explaining what she said to us in the last 80 minutes or thereabouts there. It's a scandal. Right, that's it for today's programme. I'll be back with you tomorrow morning at 9.30 with the newspaper review. Haven't a clue what's going to be on the radio show tomorrow, but I will have a couple of guests, I'm sure. We are due the phone-in show on Thursday, aren't we? So I'll be opening the phones on Thursday. Um, pretty busy week, as usual. Again, Fanola's website, fanolamoss.wordpress.com. That's fanolamoss.wordpress.com. Uh, she's a brilliant writer. A very succinct uh, writer, very clear uh, writer. So everything that she's discussed with me there, everything she's discussed with me is uh, written in great detail. Fanolamoss.wordpress.com You can't believe the country you're living in. That's it for us for today. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>